Man. So Revelation, for those who don't know, it's the last book in the New Testament. It's the last book in the Bible. And uh, so all you got to do is flip to the end and then go forward a couple of pages and you'll be right there. Man, we started in the book of Acts and we've hit every single book on the way to Revelation. (sighs) And we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 tonight. But before we get started, uh, let's just pray. Let's, uh, Let's invite God here, shall we? So, Heavenly Father, I am so excited uh, just to be here tonight. I'm so excited to be able to go through your word tonight, Father. I thank you so much for the words that you've spoken through your Apostle John 2,000 years ago. I thank you that they reverberate throughout time, and I thank you that we're still trying to understand, we're still trying to figure all this out, God. But I thank you, Jesus, for what you did that day at Calvary. I thank you for your blood that you spilt, God. And I thank you that because of that blood, that we're able to boldly approach the throne, we're able to boldly come before you, and we're able to go, Dad, I need help. So, Father, I pray, just be with us here tonight. Fill this place with your glory, with your Shekinah glory. And may we just ever fall more and more in love with you. Be here tonight, God. Speak to us in that still, small voice that we know so well. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable unto you, O Lord God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The book of Revelation is one of... hmm, well, controversy is a bit of an extreme word, but that's a good word to start with. It's the only book in the New Testament that is wholly prophetic. You know, it's, and it's, it's something that throughout the generations and throughout the ages, people have been wondering, what's going on here? What's, what's the book of Revelation being said? And last week we talked about, and I said, well, there's four basic views. There's the preterist, there's the historist, there's the spiritualist, and there's the futurist. We're not going to dive into that, just, just, just know that as Calvary Chapel, we're futurist, premillennial, and pre-tribulation, and we'll get into that later, but just, you know, just letting you know. All that being said, though, that there have been many, many good Christians that, you know, have disagreed on the book of Revelation and what's going on, and mainly, that main reason is that, well, we're dealing with future events. We're dealing with things that haven't happened yet, and so there's going to be a bit of confusion. There's going to be a bit of mystery, because we don't know. You know, it's, it's like uh, it's when Jesus was walking on the earth and people were going, well, is he the Messiah? And then, you know, he dies, he gets resurrected, and he goes into heaven. Then people go, oh, that's what that passage was about. Oh, that's what that passage is about. Oh, how did I miss it? You know, we have a saying, and it's hindsight is twenty twenty, And so that's just not where we're at. We're foresight. And so we're trying our best here. But Revelation chapter 1 and 2... Well, the key, the key, I would say, to Revelation is what it says in Revelation chapter 1. When Jesus reveals himself to the apostle John, he says, write the things, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, write the things which you have seen, the things that are, and the things that are to come. And so right here, if we had a map of the book of Revelation, if we have a map of what's going to happen in this, this is what we would see. We would see that he has written the things which are, well, there we go, which he has seen. And so he, right before this, he describes Jesus Christ in his glorified form. He describes how Jesus has eyes like fire, hair like wool, a voice like a multitude, and a sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth, able to cut, able to discern, able to divide. And so now we are getting into the things that are. And specifically, this is with the seven churches in Asia. Now, a bit of history on these seven churches. You might look at them and, you know, we see there's a, there's a little map right there, but it's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laod- and Laodicea. Now, you might be wondering, oh, well, wait a minute. I mean, I've, I've heard of a few of these churches before, but, you know, this is Jesus Christ, and He's coming, and He's talking to these churches. Why, why isn't He talking to the church of Jerusalem? 
Well, most likely that's because the book of Revelation was written after the fall of Jerusalem. And so this was after the Christians had spread throughout the known world, throughout Turkey, or throughout Asia Minor, as we call it. And so these are the seven large churches that are in this province. Now, a bit of history in this. Well, actually, let's just go through uh, verses 20 through 22 of chapter 1. Behold, says Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I grant... Wait. Oh my gosh, I did it, didn't I? I'm so sorry. (laughs) Why didn't you guys stop me? (laughs) I was getting way ahead of myself there. Sorry, sorry. So that would be 18 of chapter 1. Forgive me, guys. (laughs) Man, if I'm adding verses to that, oh boy, we're no good. All right, 18 of of chapter 1 says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen? And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the golden lamp stands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And so Jesus goes before the apostle Paul and he says, hey, I am holding a lampstand here. I'm holding these seven stars, and these seven stars are the angels above uh, these, these churches. Now, angels, the word for that is uh, messenger. And so it could either be literal angels or it could be the pastors. Both of them uh, accurately apply. And then also we see that there are seven lampstands, and each one is a representation of each one of these seven churches. Now, what's interesting about a lampstand is that it's not like a candle on a candelabra, which, you know, you you light the wick and the candle slowly dies. A lampstand is filled with oil. And so though the lampstand is is being lit and it has the fire, the, the fire does not come from the lampstand. It comes from the oil itself, much like the Holy Spirit indwells. And so we see that these seven churches, Jesus has a specific message to these seven churches. And he starts with the church in Ephesus. And that's where we're going to pick up tonight. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience. And that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Let's pause right there. Now, as we go through these seven churches... There is, uh, a, I would say, a fourfold meaning to these churches. First of all, these were real, literal churches. These were churches that we know existed in these cities. And what's interesting about these churches is that they are actually on a uh, specific uh, mail route. And so just through the, uh, through the ancient world, you'll see that as they go through the mail route, you know, you would hit Ephesus, and then you would hit Smyrna and Pergamos and so on and so forth. And they were kind of all along the way. And so because these were literal churches, the information that Jesus is saying to these literal churches is both uh, a building and correcting. And so these churches were dealing with real problems that were literally happening at the time of the writing. But, you know, a se- and a second interpretation is that these churches go through the same things that churches go through even into the present age. You'll see these things that Ephesus goes through that, you know, you'll go to a church. Maybe it's refuge, maybe it's another church, and they'll be dealing with these sorts of issues. And so this is also to be used as a practical guide for churches. Now, you'll notice at the end of uh, each section, it says... To he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so this is also supposed to be taken personally. 
So though you might have a church that is dealing with something, or you might have, you know, these ancient churches that were dealing with ancient issues, these are also issues that we deal with just as Christians. And so you'll see these things potentially pop up in your own life. And so we are supposed to take these also as personal benedictions, personal corrections. And fourthly, and this is, this is a bit interesting, there is an idea that each of these seven churches is a particular age in Christendom. And so this is, this is something, it's, it's an interesting idea, and I think it's worth being talked about, that each one of these churches is a specific age of Christianity up through the present time. You have the church of Ephesus, which connects to the early church, the very beginning church. And then you have the church of Smyrna, which would be connected to Smyrna? <laughs> Smyrna. <laughs> I'm going to say Smyrna, though, if that's all right. <laughs> and so you have the church of Smyrna, and you, that would be the, uh, between 200 and 300 A.D. And then you would have Pergamus, which would be after or be during the, the time of Constantine up until the Middle Ages and so on and so forth. Now, it's an interesting theory because if that's the case, then according to certain scholars, that means that we are either in the, uh, the church of Philadelphia or potentially the church of Laodicea, which if that's the case, uh, there's no churches after that. So, you know, that's just an idea, that's speculation, but it's interesting. It could work. But all that to being said, let's get back to Ephesus. Let's see what's going on with Ephesus and let's see what Jesus is saying. To the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your work, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is a strong church. This is a church that doesn't put up with any garbage. This is a church that goes, hey, are you, are you a Christian or are you not? Are you all in? Or, you know, if you're not, get out of here. We don't have time. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so we see that the church of Ephesus was a strong church. It was a church that didn't put up with much malarkey. It was a church that wanted you to be 100% in or get out of here. You know, it was one or the other. And though they were strong, though they persevered, though they had much patience, they left their original love for God. And I look at that and I look at my own brothers and sisters and I look at people who, yes, they're Christian and yes, they walk the walk and they talk the talk, but that fire that's in their heart is gone. They just go, all right, I went to church on Sunday, checked off the box. All right, let's do the next thing. All right, God, I've given you my hour and a half this week. I'm going to go do something else. And it's rough. We see a church that, you know, is outwardly religious. It's strong. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no doctrinal grayness. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. But they've left that love of Jesus. They've left. They've been doing so much work for God that they completely forgot about God. And I look at that and I look at my own life. Am I running around trying to serve God, trying to do all these things for church, trying to get all my ducks in my row, cross my eyes, dot my teeth, and trying to do that correctly? And I got, God, look, I'm serving for you. I'm doing all this stuff for you. And Jesus is saying, but I want to be with you. Do we spend time with Jesus? 
You know, I know the story of Mary and Martha, and you know it too, right? Martha's running around trying to get the house in order. She's like, Jesus is coming, and he brought 12 guys. We got to get the house in order. And so she's running around, sweeping up, going back and forth. And Mary, her sister, is just sitting there on the feet of Jesus, just listening. And so Mary, or Martha's angry because she goes, oh my goodness, like, help me, please. Like, I need help. And she, Jesus, can you tell my sister to help me? And how often am I like that? How often am I doing so many things for God that I've forgotten about God? How often am I trying to make sure that all my ducks in a row, I do all these things, we do all these things, but then we forget about the person that we do it for. We know, uh, we know what Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he, does, he says, there will be people who come up to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Look at these mighty works we did in your name. And Jesus says, what? Get away from me. I never knew you. It's not about what you do for God. It's spending time with God. You know, what I absolutely love is seeing new people come to the faith. I love seeing people go, wait, Jesus was real? Wait, he, he, God, God became a man and died for me? Wait, for real? And then you watch as they go, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be with God. Are you kidding me? And then they, like, they burst into flames. That's that, that first love fire you see, and they're all on fire for Jesus. And they're like, they're telling literally every single person they know. They're like, hey, check out what I did this weekend. I gave my life to the Lord, and he's real. And then somewhere, sometime along the line, you know, that, that fades. But I don't think it has to. I think we just get caught up in this world. We get caught up with all these things. We look around and we see that, hey, like, not only do some people not care, but they actually hate the fact that I, I've given my life to the Lord. And so if we're not constantly in the Word of God, if we're not constantly communicating with Jesus or just communing with Jesus, we can kind of just bury that, push it down inside and go, man. Eh. I'll just, you know, I'll just serve them on Sundays. I'll just go to church. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. But thank God it doesn't end there, right? Thank God there's no going back. Or wait, thank God that there isn't no going back. You get what I'm saying. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, turn around, do 180, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I don't know about you guys, but uh, do you know what the church of Ephesus is doing right now? I'll give you a hint. They're not doing much. They're not there. They're not there anymore. And so we look at this and we look at this practically. Was there a time in your life, was there a time in your history where you loved more God more than you love Him right now? Was there a time in your life, if you think back, was I in fire for God more than I am right now? And if that answer is yes, man, figure out what that thing is. Figure out what that thing is that's gotten in between you and God. Because as you fall in love with someone, the goal is to fall more and more and more madly in love. My, uh, my dad says, of his, he, my dad says uh, about my mom, man, she, she's not the person I married. She's something so much more. And I get to discover her more and more. And she becomes more beautiful the longer I live with her. And, though that, and that's beautiful, but that's also a depiction of our life with Jesus. Whoa, he died for me? That's pretty cool. Whoa, he's existed from the beginning of time. He collects my, my tears in a bottle. He chose me from the beginning of time. 
And then he speaks to you practically and you go, oh my goodness. And then you hear his voice and you go, whoa, is there something? Is there a time in your life where you are on fire for Jesus more? Man, repent, get back. Whatever that thing is in your life, just give it up. It's not worth it. Sorry, Jesus is the coolest thing. It, it, I love him. I really do. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and we'll talk about them here in a little bit, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him who, who goes back to the first love, what will happen? I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you give your, if you repent, if you run back, if you ask for that first love fire, if you run after him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you get to eat of the tree of life. You get to forever be with him in his presence in eternity singing holy, holy, holy. Like that was beautiful what we did tonight, but we're going to do that for millennia. Imagine seeing the, the physical presence of God and like, And going, oh my gosh, wow, you cared. You, you cared about me. And we get to spend eternity with him. Verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these things says the first and last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, though you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those which you, any of those things which you are about to suffer. And the deed, the devil, is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. There are two churches that do not have a correction. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. These churches, God doesn't have anything to say that is corrective. He just says, press on, soldier hold on. You've got this. And you'll notice that it's not, it's not, a, it's not super flowery, fluffy words. He's saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. The devil is going to come and persecute you. So hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the day. Oh, my bad. I know your works, tribulations, and poverty, though you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the Satan is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. Now, historically speaking, if the idea of the church age is true, this would be the period of 200 A.D. through 300 A.D. And it was a period of such intense persecution that some five million Christians would be beaten, executed, killed, lit on fire, thrown, torn apart by animals. It was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. That persecution of the church was unmatched in any other time from that period. Yet the church grew. Yet the church exploded. If you ever killed a pastor, everyone would scatter and start their own churches. And that's what happened. The church exploded during this time, though persecution was extreme. Potentially the idea here, though 10 days could be 10 literal days, Ten days could also be indicative of the ten Roman uh, uh, Caesars 
or yeah, that were in charge between Nero and the end uh, where Constantine came into power. There were 10 there, and so under every single one of them, there was a new, uh, incredibly creative way to kill a Christian, and it was incredibly brutal. There's, there's stories that, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about, but it wasn't good. It wasn't easy, and there was intense persecution through that time, and that was also what was literally happening in Smyrna. In fact, it had a uh, strong Jewish population, and that Jewish population was excited to hear about the things of God, but when they found out that Jesus was the Messiah, man, they turned. They didn't want to hear of that. And though they claimed to be true followers, you know, this isn't, this isn't anti-Semitic rhetoric, though they claimed to be true followers of the way, they persecuted the church. And so you see that Satan literally <laughs> wants to throw people into prison. And what does it say? It says, be faithful until death. What, is, what does Jesus say? He says, if you acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. But if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before the Father. And though I don't know what it looks like to be in that spot, to be, hey, recant, and you get to live. You get to have a good life, you know? There was a time in Japanese history in the, in the early 1600s where there was that idea where Portuguese missionaries were coming to uh, Japan, and Japan was not into it at all. And so they would go to those Portuguese missionaries, and they would say, hey, if you recant your faith, you get to live in lavish excellence. But if you don't, we'll not only kill you, but we'll kill every single person that you told about Jesus. And I want to say that I would say, oh yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for Jesus. Like that's my thing, but like, What I do know is that Jesus says that if you acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. And if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before the Father. As we go through um, Easter, we hear the story of Judas who betrays Jesus, is so distraught that he goes and he kills himself. He denied Jesus before man. But then you also see Peter, who also denied Jesus before man. He says, I swear to you, I never knew the man. And Jesus makes eye contact with him. Then the rooster crows. And Peter ran away weeping bitterly. And so you look, you look at that, but what happens? What happens? Jesus comes back. He redeems. And all of a sudden, Peter becomes one of the strongest foundings, founders of the church through the Holy Spirit. Pr Peter preaches once and 3,000 people give their lives to the Lord. Church history says that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't think it was, he was good enough to be crucified in the way that Jesus was crucified. It's pretty cool, I gotta say. So, you know, we call them seasons, right? We call them seasons of hardship. You know, you'll have high highs with a Christian and then you'll see everything and you'll go, oh my gosh, God is so good. And then something really bad will happen. And you'll go, where is God? The dark night of the soul. But hold on, Christian. Hold on. Wait. For though fall happens and the leaves die and the ground withers and winter happens and everything's dead and frozen and cold, there's still spring and spring comes and the bloom is more beautiful than the previous spring. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. There's a passage of the Bible that says, 
Do not fear what man will do to you. He can only destroy the body. But fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. You know, if you are in the will of God, and if God is calling you to do something strong, there is nothing that man can do to you. They stoned Paul. They killed him, and they threw him outside of the, of the, the gates. He woke up and walked back into the city. Like, there's nothing that man can do to you if God doesn't allow it. What would it look like? God's the one that holds the atoms together. He showed up once and he split time in half. And he says, hey, I love you. Like, a lot. Watch what I can do. Go talk to that person. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who ever comes shall not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. And do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold up the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block between the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold on to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with a sword, with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so we have one of the stronger corrections, one of the stronger rebukes that Jesus gives to the church of Pergamos. First of all, if uh, Ephesus was the New York City of that day and age, Pergamos would have been the Washington, D.C. It's where things were done. It's where things were taken care of. This was a place where people ruled. And so there were great, it was a, it was a very opulent, a very beautiful place to live. And it was a place that nobles and rulers lived. And you'll notice something. That's where Satan lived. Now, there is something I want to say. Satan is real. He is. He is a created being, and he's not omnipotent. You know, he's not a, you know, he's not, he doesn't know your thoughts, but he is physically somewhere on this planet. Now, at the time of this writing, Satan was physically in Pergamos. And you can see that because of the opulence that was in Pergamos. You can see that because of the, the vices that even had slipped into the church. You can see that, man, there were only two rules that Gentiles had to follow if they were Christians. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't commit sexual immorality. And these were broken. These two rules, that's all we got. Love Jesus. Um, love Jesus with everything you got. Love your neighbor with everything you got. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't have sexual immorality. That was it. That's all we get. Like those are the only things that we, <laughs> that we have to follow. And here we see that this church of Pergamos just completely abandoned that. But what I absolutely love before I jump into that note is uh, this man by the name of Antipas. I have recently been going through uh, my genealogy. My last name is Warwick, and so I was looking at my father and his father and his father, and I ended up getting back to the 18th century. And the farther back you go, the, uh, the shorter and the smaller the, uh, the words are. One of them, <laughs> one of them said he, uh, he, <laughs> he died one year after he fell off a barrel of hay, or a bale of hay. <laughs> I was like, I never did well after that. And that's his whole life. His whole life was summed up in one sentence like that. But yet we see Antipas, 
when his entire life, he's not mentioned in any extra biblical uh, readings anywhere. He's not mentioned by Eusebius or Polycarp or any of the, uh, the early church fathers, fathers or the middle church fathers. He's not mentioned anywhere else or in any other writings within the Bible except for right here. And what does it say? The days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. The word for martyr here is martos. It's also translated witness. He was my faithful witness. And he lost his life because he was a faithful witness. When you come to the end of your days, when your great-grandchildren look at the, the paragraph and a half of your obituary, what will it say? Say, oh, he did well. He did well for himself. He had a you know, he had a big house on the coast of the beach. Or will it say, like, he was a strong or she was a strong believer in Jesus. There was no one who didn't know how much they loved their God. Look at your life. If you could pull out 3,000 miles and say one sentence about your life, what would you want that to be? I want to be like Antipas, who was God's faithful witness. Hey, Amen. Yet I have these things up against you because you have held on to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. That's Jesus Jesus is saying, hey, anyone who calls themselves a Nicolaitan, I hate them. <laughs> That's some strong wording, right? But it says it right there. He says, I hate what these people are saying. I hate, I hate these things that they're saying. You know, Jesus says even to the Pharisees, if you cause any one of my little ones to stumble, it would be better if you took a millstone, threw it around your neck, and just cast yourself into the middle of the ocean. Jesus has a strong opinion about those who teach incorrectly. Jesus has a really strong opinion of those who lead little children away from God or give them a warped view. And little children could be literal little children or young believers in the faith. It's both. And so you see here that the Nicolaitans, um, well, I'm doing a bit of extra biblical research. They believed that there was a difference between your spirit and your physical body. And so your spiritual, your spirit had needs and your physical body had needs. And, you know, if you were just doing things, you know, just you're doing it as it is. And it was so against the word of God, that idea that, that a man can live with his girlfriend, that, a, that someone can live outside of what is biblical marriage and still claim to be, oh, I'm going to be blessed by God. That's just not the case at all ever. If you're wondering why God doesn't speak to you and you have a sin in your life, well, I'll tell you right there. They, you might want to start there. You're like, hey, God, I give everything. I give you my entire life. I give you every. Yeah, just, I, I, don't, I don't give you this, this closet in my room. You know, I, I give you my whole life. I give you my whole house. You can have everything. Just, you know, let me have this closet here real quick. Or, you know, or like, don't, just don't, don't open up that shoebox in the top left corner of my closet. That's my, you know, that, that's just my thing. Give it all to God. Why would you give 98% and miss heaven by 100 feet? The Nicolaitans taught things that were just wrong, just abjectly wrong. There were only two rules, and we see that the church was being deceived and perverted into thinking, oh, that, that's, that's totally fine. God will still bless me if I do these things. No. <laughs> In fact, that goes all the way back to the book of Acts when Gentiles were getting saved and getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And James says, hey, you know, that's great. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols. Don't, uh, don't, have any, uh, don't commit any sexual immorality. Don't do anything outside of what is biblical marriage. And we see here that this church in Pergamos didn't abide by that. 
And we see that there is a consequence for it. You know, Jesus is loving, and part of that loving is that correction. Yes, Jesus gives mercy to a thousand generations to the one that repents, but he is also a just God, punishing to the second and third generation for the sins of the Father. He delights in mercy. He doesn't want to enact justice, but he's a just God. If I had regarded iniquity in my heart, you would not have heard me, it says in Psalms. So what things hold you back? Is there anything in your life that you've like, ah, I want to give this to God, but you know, like, you know, like, mm, you know, maybe later, maybe another time. Oh God, like, just help me, help, help me deal with this. And then, you know, you run to it. If there's anything that you do not give to God, that is your God. Just 100%. If there's anything that you put in between your relationship with God, that is actually your God. That's the thing that you run to for comfort. That's the thing that you run to when life is hard. That's the thing that you run to when life is tough and no one understands. That is to be God and God alone. And he speaks to you. We see an emphasis like, don't leave your first love. And so we see actually two incredibly different churches here. There are actually three incredibly different churches. We see a church that is religiously strong. You know, we see a pharisaical church. We have a church that has their ducks in a row. Man, they probably were in a full three-piece suit when they came to church. But they left their love of God. And then we see a church over here, the church of Pergamos. We see a church that is, man, they probably have love. Yes, there's been people that have died in their congregation that were faithful martyrs, but yet they're entertaining other fantasies. There's things of the world that have crept in. Jesus talks about the four soils, right? The, the, the seeds that fall into the hard ground and get crushed. The seeds that go into the shallow ground, shoot up and die because of the sun. And then there's the good soil, right? Where the, the seed goes down, gets buried, and great roots grow, and it shoots up. But then there's also that third soil. There's that third soil, which is where the, the seeds go down. They bury into the, into the ground. Their roots grow deep, and they shoot up, and they get choked out by the thorns of the world. They get choked out by the, the, the pleasures and the wiles and the love of what the world has to offer. Man, talk to anybody. <laughs> My mama says there's a God-shaped hole in everyone's life. There's always something you're trying to fill that emptiness with. And if you're trying to fill it with, man, anything with that, that isn't God, it's just not going to fit. Oh, but maybe, maybe there's this, maybe there's that. Or like, Caleb, I've been a Christian for a long time and I'm still empty. Well, have you given everything to God? Have you spent time in prayer with him recently? He's the God who speaks. He's the God that lives. His spirit, and it says in, it says in Genesis that God formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed his spirit, his ruach, into that clay, and man became a living soul. So be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spend time with God. And just watch. Watch as your life radically transforms. If you're looking for anything to give you life, if you're looking to anyone to give you life aside from Jesus, you're going to come up short. I'm going to come up short. <laughs> talk to any of the old saints or talk to any of the, uh, the people that have been long walking with God, and they'll tell you. In fact, I, I absolutely love and hate some of the old hymns that we'll, we'll sing because every single time I go through something <laughs> miserable and gnarly, there's a, there's a hymn right there for me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full at his wonderful face. And what? This, the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. <sighs> So we're not going to get to Thyatira tonight. I didn't think, I was hoping we could, but 
We're going to be here for another 45 minutes. Unless you guys want to do that. <laughs> um, no, not tonight. We'll do it next week, though. Don't you worry. Um, but how do we, what do we do with this? How do we take this? How, what, like, Caleb, what do I do? What do I do? How, do? how do I give your life to God? If there's anything that keeps you from God, throw it away. Throw it away. It's not worth it. If there is anyone that keeps you from God, but like, you know, what if like, oh, but like, you know, do they draw you closer to God or not? Ultimately, you know, uh, it, was, it was Adam when, uh, when God said, oh, Adam, what have you done? He said, it was the woman. The woman made me do it. God didn't blame Eve. He blamed Adam. And so in that, you know, you can't blame someone else. Like, oh, God, like this person keeps me from, this person keeps me from you. Oh, God, like, you know, it's it, like, I'll follow you after I get this thing. No, it's, it's, you are responsible for your life. You are responsible for your relationship with God. So don't let the world, first of all, don't let the world choke out that love for God. Don't let the world choke out the holiness of God either. Holiness is set apart, special. You know, we're created in the image of God. The Imago Dei, right? So I think ultimately the answer is repent. And man, if you're going through, if you're going through a really rough time, hold on, right? That's what, uh, that's what the church of Smyrna is going through. Man, they're going through a really tough time. It's only going to get worse. But hold on. So that's, what we'll, that's, that's how we'll end. So let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, there is so much that we can learn from these churches. There's so much that, uh, that guides us. But ultimately, <laughs> where else will we go, says Peter, for you alone have the words of life. God, though life is tough, though life is difficult, you're there with us, you're there for us. And if our God is for us, who can be against us? So God, I pray, may we give up things that are false idols, that are false gods, that are false security blankets, God. And if we've fallen into religiosity, if we've fallen into f just being a Pharisee, doing so many works and forgetting about the one that we're working for, may we repent of that as well. God, we love you. We need your love more than everything. And so be with us tonight. Convict us of the things that need convicting and build us up, God, in the things that we need to be built up in. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your love and for your grace. And in your name we pray. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.